You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgvm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGVM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we're at Extreme History Headquarters, speaking via Zoom with Nikki Manning and Kate Gonzalez, who are in Missoula, Montana. We're talking with these two ladies about the archaeology of the historic red light districts and historic Chinese communities in the West, specifically around Missoula. So I want to start by introducing both of you a little bit to our listeners. So I'm going to read a bio for uh, each of you, for you, Nikki, and for you, Kate. Okay. So Nikki Manning is currently a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Montana. Her dissertation is entitled Beyond Preservation, Adaptive Reuse, Deconstruction, and the Archaeology of Buildings. It is an interdisciplinary approach to historic preservation that includes research in the fields of urban archaeology, architectural history, and heritage conservation. Nikki's master's thesis was entitled Historic Underground Missoula and is now a book that focuses on understanding um, the excavation and oral history surrounding the city's subterranean features. Nikki has completed multiple archaeological surveys in downtown Missoula's historic district, but her passion includes public outreach and education in the fields of archaeology and historic preservation. Kate Gonzalez is currently a master's student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Montana. Her thesis focuses on Missoula's early red light district. She employs both historical archaeology methods and feminist theory to better understand the daily lives of women working as prostitutes. Through her research, she hopes to identify acts of social difference in the archival and material record from which alternative narratives for women can emerge, and her passion is to develop methodologies to interpret gender and sexuality in a way that helps us understand the role of the recent past in shaping contemporary society. Welcome, Nikki and Kate, to The Dirt on the Past. Thank you. Hello. Thanks. We're happy to be here. We're excited. We, yes. we like when we get to talk about our, our stuff. Great. <laughs> Great. That's why you're here. We're, we're thrilled. Thanks. Uh, well, we're so happy to have you both here. Nikki and Kate, I know that I've had the opportunity to work with Nikki a few times, and your passion for what you do and your enthusiasm is just wonderful. I love it so much. And I know, Kate, you probably have that same passion and enthusiasm. Nikki is nodding her head yes, so <laughs> so that's wonderful. So I just wanted to uh, dive into your backgrounds a little bit and ask you both, what brought you to archaeology? What, when and why did you become interested in, in pursuing the field of anthropology or more specifically anthrop- archaeology? How did you know when you were interested? Yeah. yeah. So this is Nikki. I, I've been interested in it for a very long time. I, my undergrad was actually in sociology but I minored in anthropology, Um, but I didn't really do any archeology. span And then I took a really long one year break between that and grad school. Um, And so when I came to grad school, I planned on continuing in the cultural anthropology sphere. And um, it just, it kind of didn't click for me like I hoped it would. And then the underground project came along and basically changed my life forever. Um, I had almost I I had almost 
uh, quit grad school after the first year because I thought maybe this isn't working. Um, um, and then that's that fall semester, I thought, well, maybe I'll just try a little bit longer. And that's when the underground project came about. And um, so I knew then that I was making the switch um, to archaeology, much to my advisor's chagrin. Um, <laughs> Nikki, do you think it was in part because it was a project that was meaningful right there where you were living and meaningful to the local community? What do you think was so powerful about that project that drew you to uh, switch areas within anthropology so completely? I think at first it was mostly just interest. Um, it was a very, very intriguing, I mean, we're going to talk about the fact that, you know, people seem to find these spaces interesting. Um, and so, and I, it, that I'm, I'm the same way. And so I think that was part of it. Um, the community side of it came along a little bit later once we started working with the community and getting out, doing some events and things. Um, because I was very, very shy. I'm still very, very shy. Um, and so that wasn't part of what I was thinking in the beginning. But once I, once I had those opportunities, it, I just fell in love with it um, and working with people in the community. And you know, I really enjoy urban archaeology in particular. Um, and it just kind of, I also have a, a passion and a knack for finding those little, little known stories um, somehow. And so I also just kind of, I had the advantage of being able to design my own program of study to some degree because I was able to incorporate not only archaeology, but architecture and architectural history um, and then getting involved in preservation work as well. So it all just kind of made this nice, beautiful package for me that just everything that I was passionate about. So. Yeah, it all kind of came together in that it's underground it. project. Right, right. That urban setting really kind of allowed all those things to come together. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of it that way. That's That sounds very fun. You're Plus just underground spaces are fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're sure. lucky that that all kind of came to fruition at that time as well. So, And Eric. we're lucky that it did so that you went into this field of study. That's great. Well, what about you, Kate? Yeah, I think um, I've always kind of had an interest in history and anthropology. And it wasn't really until I came to Missoula and came to the University of Montana that I really um, saw like what could actually be accomplished with archeology. span I took um, a class from Kelly Dixon and a field school with Nikki. And um, the field school was, I think like one of the best summers I've ever had in my life. We were looking for um, a signature of a privy and you know we were just finding rusted nails and but like the excitement that I felt there was so genuine and awesome and then through that all these other local projects have opened up and kind of shown me the importance you know of this local history and all the connections that can be made with the local community and business owners and how you can really create a system that works for everyone you know in regards to preservation and you know, preserving this history, which I think right. is really great. Yeah, you know, the privies bring us in, but then, you know, the community <laughs> engagement hooks us, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I I um I got a chance to work in Virginia City on a small section of um a parking lot that was being swapped for another parcel and finding those those little even though it was just a very small text excavation it was stunning how much came out of it but then to also have the community walking by and being involved in it that was my sort of my small experience with urban archaeology and it was incredibly fun and not only what you're finding but the interaction you know with folks mm -hmm. so we wanted to talk to you guys um, about that today uh, particularly your work on an archaeological site in Missoula's historic red light district so you both have had the opportunity the rare opportunity to investigate a city lot that once had buildings that was really associated with that landscape of vice in Missoula in the um, late um, uh, 19th century. So can you give us an overview a bit about that project and um, how it is that you even came to have the opportunity to excavate it? Much like a lot of our other projects, it was kind of um, 
it was just kind of happenstance. I mean, we, this is a particular site in downtown Missoula that we've always been interested in. It's behind a couple of businesses that face Main Street. Um, there's a yard back there and it used to have a fence around it. And we kind of always had this idea that it was fairly undisturbed um, land in downtown Missoula, which there isn't much of at this point. Um, and so we'd always been interested in it. And then when all of those businesses closed um, and the, the public house owners that are there now bought the land, um, before they actually got started, they already had hired their brewer, um, because they're also a brewery and to meet Yvonne. And he, um, he contacted us because they had basically, since he couldn't brew yet, they put him on, like, see if you can find any information about this property. See if you can find any historical information. So he contacted the archives here, uh, Donna McCray at the archives. And then she told him to talk to us. Um, and so he reached out to me and so Kate Kolwitz and I went down to meet him one day um, and he showed us some of the bottles and things that they had already found. They found an, an old Lysol bottle and, and Kate's going to tell you about that, but um, and a couple liquor bottles. And then we went out back and started walking around and literally on the surface, we found um, a couple pieces of Celadon ceramics, which is associated with the Chinese. Um, usually. And so um, we were pretty excited about that, which made him excited, which made the owners excited. <laughs> um, and then we started, um, we told him about Cranky Sam, which we're going to talk about in a little bit too. But we told him about Cranky Sam and he said, that's a great name for a beer. And he went to the owner and he mm -hmm. said, that's going to be one of the names of the beer. And the oh, owner said, "Fantastic! that makes a great name for a business. Oh, so wow. they came they changed the name of their uh, business. Oh they had, gosh. they had, what was it supposed it was to be? Black Timber Brewing. Yeah. Before. And so they changed it to Cranky Sam Public House, um, wow. changed their logo and everything. And so we started doing some historical research before they started construction. But once they started construction, I mean, we found out that the land was originally owned by C.P. Higgins, um, which was really cool. The building, one of the buildings that's there, the stone building, um, that's on the corner of the lot is probably, if not the oldest, one of the oldest buildings left in Missoula at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, it was like a warehouse, um, a hardware warehouse. And so we started finding all the information related to the Chinese and the red light district, which we kind of already knew. Um, and then once construction started, I mean, it was the very definition of salvage archaeology. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, we were down there with the construction crew, um, the I should give a plug. The construction crew from Knife River were awesome. That's um, great. They were great. We like to we like to consider part of our work that we do construction worker outreach. Right. Uh, exactly. <laughs> once you get them interested and get them excited about what's what they might be finding, then things happen. Like they call you randomly and say, "Hey, we found this. You should come on down." Yeah, that's great um, to have such a good so relationship. We, yeah, we were able to do that, and also. You know, they didn't kick us off site when they were digging trenches and we were running over and grabbing artifacts at the same time, you know, as they moved around. And it's nice when they see you as a as an asset and not as something just slowing down construction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To the point where they would they were very, um, very precise with those bulldozers and they would, oh, yeah. you know, they would pick things out even and turn around, drop them at our feet for us and try not to break them. You know? Wow. So, and so that's, that's kind of how it got started anyway. Yeah. And then I think as we began collecting those artifacts and we brought them back to the lab here on campus, um, as we started to clean everything up, um, there was just a huge amount of faunal remains. I think that's the largest portion of what we recovered. So animal um, bones, what kind of bone, what kind of animal bones were coming out? Well, we're in the process of really analyzing those and um, figuring that out. But from what we can see so far, there was a pork, beef, um, chicken, obviously, but then there was also um, a lot of seafood. So oh, we yeah. have okay. mussel shells, um, clam shells, mm. crab Not something claws. you expect to find in Montana. Right, right. Exactly. Right. And so um, 
so that was a lot of that was the largest portion but then you know artifacts relating to the chinese community were um, a large portion of a chinese cleaver um various ceramics like nikki was talking about artifacts related to opium use um medical bottles gaming pieces things like that so um, kate what were the artifacts um that you would find related to opium use so we would find um a lot of uh, opium bowls, okay. um, items related to the, the pipe, and they were all constructed together um, to form the pipe that they would smoke out of. But then also a lot of um, opium tins as well, where they were storing their, their opium. And those, I think, are the most interesting because they are they have um, like remnants of cartouches and things like that and, uh, hmm. and symbols for different uh, ceremonies and uh, reasons why these were gifted. Um, same thing with the bowls; they're marked with those as well. Oh wow! Do you, are, are they being imported? Do you think are they made locally? I believe. I think that they were either brought over since they were, mm -hmm. you know, um, important, given at a wedding, say, or you know, some type of special occasion. But I, I do believe that they, you know, they were possibly getting them from the, the local merchants as well. Mm -hmm. I think it might be a combination mm -hmm. of both. What time period are we talking about, do you think, for most of the artifacts that you we were getting out of this excavation? Um, I would definitely say late, late 19th century to early 20th. Um, some of the earliest, I think, so far that we've dated are around, I would say, 1880. And then that on the other end, going down to the okay, 1920s. Okay. Uh, but we're, I'm still really early in my research and the collection so large. We're slowly getting through it. If you could see the boxes behind <laughs> us. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot yeah. of box. Yep. That looks like a lab to me. Yeah. <laughs> Nikki, when was Missoula founded? Because I know, I mean, with Bozeman, we're sort of on the early end of things here in Montana. How does Missoula compare to that founding date? Um. So Hellgate Village was a little bit earlier, which was a little further west at Little Road. Um, but Missoula Mills, which was the beginning of Missoula, I would say it was like 1866, 1867. Yeah. So quite That's early, about, still about, about the same, same time. time as Bozeman then. I thought maybe it was a bit later. Um, so if so, on the early end of what you're finding, it's, it's kind of within that first generation of people settling oh, yeah. in that area and the town getting started. Okay. Definitely. Fascinating. So, so Kate, what about Cranky Sam? I want to hear more about Cranky Sam. Oh, Nikki's got all the dirt on Cranky Sam. <laughs> oh, she Sam. does? Okay. <laughs> Nikki. Um, so Cranky Sam was, it's kind of funny. We found out, we found Cranky Sam in the newspapers, actually back when we were doing the underground project. Um, we found him by accident, really. And um, that's pretty much the only place we get information about Cranky Sam. We don't know his last name. We don't really know how old he was. Um as far as we know, we've never really been able to find him in the census, um, but not knowing his name for sure, um, that's kind of hard to, to tell. Uh, he kind of got the name, I don't know where really the cranky part comes from, but he was, he spent, a, how do I say this? He spent a lot of time in court. Um, mm. <laughs> he, was, he was arrested a lot. Um, but there are articles about him that kind of talk about how he would almost entertain the court to the point that, um, and, and I don't necessarily know that that's a good thing because um, they were probably often just making fun of him mm. um, and, his, and his broken English and so on. But according to the newspapers, he was the opium king of Missoula. Um, but we're not sure, you know, we take what, uh, things out of the newspaper with a grain of salt, obviously. Right, um, right. Unless we can corroborate it with a bunch of other stuff. Right. Um, we know that he was popular. We know that he actually wasn't even associated necessarily with the site where the Cranky Sam Public House is. Um, we know that he was at the Joss House sometimes. We know that he spent time in a building across the street. Um, but as far as we know, 
he probably lived in the shanty town that was in the set that was in the middle of the river at the mm -hmm. time. Um, and so the, we know he was very popular. Um, he had a really nice obituary written about him. And even though he kind of didn't belong in any part of the Missoula community or society, really, even the Chinese didn't seem to really embrace him. Um, his obituary was very nice hmm. and still doesn't tell, tell us his real name, hmm. but he, you know, he, they actually had a nice funeral for him. Um, he would have been buried as far as we know up in the Chinese cemetery that used to be in the lower rattlesnake. Um, and he and was, so, he was Chinese, Nikki. He was, yeah. yes, definitely. Hmm. And, um, so we just kind of became fascinated with him at the time. And then, when we started doing this project and realized that, you know, he kind of, he kind of had, that was his neighborhood, really. That was, that was his stomping grounds. Um, and the public house owners just kind of really took to that story. And mm -hmm. so, and they, they do a really good job of, you know, explaining who he was. They have some really nice newspaper articles that they had blown up that they have hanging on the wall in the public house to kind of explain the origin of their name. And, um, yeah, so I hmm. think he's just, it's, it's very nice for us because we saw him as this kind of outcast at one time. And now here we are in 2021 and he has a, he has a, um, a brewery named after him. Right. So right. it makes him kind of proud sometimes. We feel very proud about that. <laughs> yeah, definitely the past and the present right now. I'm curious because you say he was popular, but he wasn't well embraced by the community. So can you explain a little bit? Because that sounds like a contradiction. What do you mean by yeah. he was popular? Yeah, popular in the sense that everybody knew who he was. Okay, um, that doesn't necessarily mean they liked him. Hmm. Gotcha. So um, why was why wasn't he part of that Chinese community? What was was it just because um, or do you have any thoughts or any ideas or any evidence that? I wish we knew more, um, like, that we could have more concrete information about it. I think, I think it might have been, I mean, this is kind of speculation, but I think it might have had more to do with the fact that, you know, because he was known as the Opium King, because he was arrested a few times, quite a few times, um, for opium, for selling opium, um, providing it to people, um, you know, and and it wasn't just the Chinese community smoking opium, as I'm sure you know. Most people are starting to realize that, you know, it was it was also the the upstanding so-called you know um, leaders even of of a community that would be smoking opium at times. And so I think that's one reason they didn't like him from that side of things because it was kind of um, he was leading them leading people down a a path of temptation, I guess, and abuse and addiction. And mm, for the Chinese yeah. community, I think it was, you know, they were trying to um, get away from that type of, that stereotype of, that they already had. And so I think that's one of the reasons that they probably, and he was always, I mean, he was just always getting into trouble and fights and yeah. things like that. So, huh. so you said he's managed to avoid uh, the census and being documented that way, um, which is fascinating because there's a, sounds like a huge paper trail of all his uh, <laughs> court interactions. And is he referred to in the newspapers as Cranky Sam? He just somewhere always. along the way. And that's always, is he referred to in court that way? Yes. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, I don't know, maybe they didn't know his name. They didn't understand. A lot of times yeah. they didn't understand names even when they would give them. So they would just call them whatever they would know them by, if they could remember them by or yeah. nicknames if they would give them. So. Kind of those nicknames, right, right. Yeah we, yeah, we had a fascinating conversation with Mark Johnson about his research on the Chinese community and and we talked about that, how here in Bozeman as well, you know, we have all we have a lot of um um we had a I wouldn't say a large Chinese community, but we had a, a you know, a Chinese community here in Bozeman. And uh, we have, it's hard to track them because they would call the Chinese community members China Mary or China Jim. And so it's hard to kind of, you know, 
uh, relate those people to people's names in the census. Because oftentimes here in Bozeman, anyway, the census taker would would write their their true Chinese names down. But but how do you correlate that then? You know, so okay. yeah. So what about Missoula's Chinese historic Chinese community? Um, can you talk a little bit more about that in a broader sense? Yeah. Um, so the Chinese community in Missoula. Um, also like Bozeman, it was not very large. Um, at 18, in 1890, they had about 405 people and that was like its heyday. Um, that was the most we saw listed. Um, and then based on the Sandhorn maps in 1902, uh, the block where our site is located, um, it had a the Chinese general store um, various Chinese dwellings, and then also the Joss House. Um, Can you tell me what a Joss House is, Kate? Yeah, so um, a Joss House is a basically a Chinese temple, and um, especially for the overseas Chinese communities, they were very important places um, where, you know, all kinds of events and festivals and, you know, religious ceremonies were held, and I mean, I think it was an important kind of meeting place for the community it was always listed in the Chinese directories and things like that. So, and is um, that, is that listed on the Sanborn maps for that block as a, as a Joss house or a temple? It's not listed exactly as such. Um, it's just listed as I believe just Chinese. Um, but it is mentioned pretty frequently in the newspapers, um, especially during, um, like I said, the festivals, like, the, the lunar new year and things like that. Um, and it is listed in the folk directory as well. Oh, wow. And, nice. and we got our hands on a, on a Chinese directory at one point. For oh, the, wow. Wow. So, yeah, it, a lot of it we can't read, but... Yeah, right, right. But, um, you yeah. know, most of it's in English, and so it lists the Joss House at that particular site. Wow. Yeah. We actually found out about it. We didn't know that there was a Joss House. We had never seen any reference to it in our research at that point, and then a few years ago, um, two people from CINARC, which is the Chinese and Northwest America Research Committee, um, Ben and Shume, um, they actually contacted Kelly, because Kelly Dixon, because they knew her from other things, and said that they were coming into town to do some research in the archives, and they said, hey, we know that you had a Joss house at a particular this particular place, do you know anything about it? And we were like, oh, we do? <laughs> did wow! So that was pretty exciting. Yeah, wow. that's that kind of put us on the right track to start looking for it. Is it no longer there? Is that building gone? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's long gone. Hmm. Now it's Ega Pizza. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great pizza place. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what members of the Chinese community? What were they doing? How were they making their living? Maybe a little bit about how they were treated. I mean, it's fascinating to know that they did have a Joss House, a sense of c community, and kind of a central place. It seems maybe more so than other parts of Man Montana. There might have been a, a sense of a cohesive community in Missoula. Yeah, I definitely think. Um... I think a lot of the overseas Chinese community, they were involved in restaurants, um, various laundries. There were quite a few Chinese laundries in Missoula. Um, you know, they originally came in the 1880s, late 1880s, when the Northern Pacific Railroad came through Missoula. And then I think they kind of went into those other domestic professions after that and until, um, you know, I think the their living situations in a time of you know the Chinese Exclusion Act and all of these all this you know anti sentiment that's going on probably made it pretty difficult to to stay and make a living. Um, but I think more research into that would have to be done to kind of determine if that was a main factor. Mm -hmm. But there is a section. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask about, you mentioned, Nikki, the section of the cemetery. Is there a separate section for Chinese? So there, because we know early on, a lot of times people were hoping to then have their remains re-excavated and sent home. Um, what was the situation in Missoula? Do you know, did many people end up just staying buried there? Or do you have some evidence of these re-excavated? Because we talked about that a lot with... 
Mark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually, that's actually a really good question and also very involved. Um, there was, so there was a, there was the Cherry Street Cemetery, which is at the end of Cherry Street in the lower Rattlesnake neighborhood here in Missoula. Um, and that's where we know they were, they were buried, they were buried there primarily. Um, the original Missoula Cemetery was over there as well before they moved it um, to where it is today. And so there would have been probably a, a certain section over there. But once they moved the cemetery, um, as far as we know, probably not everybody got moved. Mm -hmm. um, and that would have that would have definitely included the Chinese because I think a lot of times too, they wouldn't have necessarily had a headstone. And so um, they wouldn't have even necessarily known they were there. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a big problem. Um, there's actually houses built there at this point. Oh boy. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's a very yeah. involved question. We actually <laughs> have a student who's working on that, um, that project that kind of research and may actually go to grad school and work on that some more mm. um, because the, the poor farm cemetery was in the lower rattlesnake as well. So, but in a different location. Um, and so some of them may have ended up there. We don't really have, when we have, when we go looking for information about the Chinese in Missoula, we have to dig pretty deep. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not easy information to find. Um, yeah. As far as we know, they, they weren't hated here as much. Um, I think we've always found that Missoula was a fairly diverse and accepting community like it is today, um, which is interesting to us. Hmm. But we, yeah, there were, there were incidents here and there, you know, sometimes kids would throw rocks, um, that kind of thing. But hmm. for the most part, I think they were fairly quiet and comfortable and kept to themselves. Yeah, definitely the keeping to themselves part is um, trying to find um, any record of the Chinese community in the through the census records is often really difficult. They're, they don't seem to be listed very often. So possibly they were hiding from census takers or yeah, just wanting to not be recognized in that way. Right, right, yeah. Which We're, I'm sure throws off our numbers too. Yeah, you know, I know. You know, that's, you know, 400 is a pretty big number. Our, at our height than Bozeman, we had about 75. So you guys had a much bigger Chinese community than, than we did here in Bozeman. So when I heard 400, I was like, wow. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that was in 1890, I think yeah. you said. When do you see that population decline or what happens in the, yeah. in the decades after that? So we, um, I know specifically for the, the block where our site is located, you see a lot of those Chinese um, buildings listed on the Sanborn. They're almost all gone by 1912. And we found out that that happened actually around sometime, I think around 1909. Okay. Um, and then by 1910, we only had about 72 residents listed. So wow. the drop was pretty significant after that, um, especially in that area because the red light district just kind of took over. Um, and expanded a lot within those uh, early years of um, the 20th century. So, Okay, mm -hmm. so we're going to ask you a little bit more about that in a second, but we just have to take a quick station break. You are listening to The Dirt on the Past with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman. We're speaking today with Nikki Manning and Kate Gonzalez about their work to uncover information on Missoula's historic red light district and historic Chinese community. So ladies, Nikki and um, Kate, we are interested also in the um, public component you had with this project, what that looked like and um, in, what, in what ways did you create elements where the public could be involved in the project? And was that sort of integral to the beginning and planning of the project? Or did you have to find ways to modify as it went along? Well, I mean, we always, we always make sure that we, it, I mean, that's just a passion of mine and pretty much everybody that I work with here on most of the projects that I do and Kelly Dixon as well. That's like, 
that's her, she always wants to make sure that she ingrains that in students. Like uh, there has to be a public archeology span component to a lot of things. Um, and we really just enjoy talking to people in the community because you'd be surprised what you can learn. Um, yeah. Right, so much not comes surprised. out, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, we like to share what we learn because it's important to them. And also, you know, we like them to share with us what what they know and have heard through the years, because a lot of people that we talk to in the community, their families have been here for a really long time. Um, and we also like to find out what they want to know. And so that we can kind of, you know, try to answer those questions as well. Um, so it's always been a big part of what we do in, in our projects downtown. Um, it's almost kind of expected these days. They almost see us downtown and think, what are you meddling kids up to now? <laughs> Um, and I, that's, we've heard that actually before. So, um, that's not even a, you need a a mystery van to uh, drive around. So, but what does it look like actually? What, how do you involve the public or do you just welcome them on site? Are they down in the trenches? Are they driving their own bulldozers? What's going on? Tell us how it works. You want to learn how to drive bulldozers. Um, (laughs) so it, it also, it often depends on the project really, because, you know, with the underground project, we had a lot of different events um, that we would have to either show what we had found, talk about the information that we had found. Um, we also um, we have a we have an Instagram page for our lab, which is Montanthropology. Oh, cool! Um, and so that's really cool for this particular project at Cranky Sands. Um, things obviously got really weird really quick because of the pandemic, and so. Oh yeah, um, you know we were we were kind of the the we were kind of the zoo animals for the summer of 2019 because there was a chain link fence around the site, and so people would come by and you know as long as if somebody even slows down, we're happy to talk to them. So this was interesting doing the public component part with the pandemic. I didn't realize that, so that really limited to some degree what you could do, although Instagram is great and having the social media things, but at least you could still have an opportunity for people to walk by in fresh air and see. Well, the, that part of it was actually the summer before. So that was in 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, the, once we were able to start finding information and could put together some of these stories, um, we wanted to, we had plans with the owners to have events like, um, ask an archaeology ar- archaeologist night, um, oh, or you know, we wanted to help them with displays because they're actually going to display a lot of the either artifacts or really nice photos, like big blown up photos, and and you know, with information next to them, um, and kind of rotate that out. And so we've been working with that, but like I said, the pandemic that's the part that the pandemic really I slowed see. down because they didn't even okay. get to open like they wanted to. I hope, Nikki, that you guys can do that in the in future years because I think that would be so amazing, you know, to have ask an archaeologist at the you know at the brewery, you know, during the summertime. Wouldn't that be We're fun? We're starting to talk about it already. Oh, okay. good. So hopefully soon. Yeah. And everybody drinking cranky Sam beer while they're doing it. I mean, that's yeah. just fantastic. That that's a win win all the way around. I love it. I love that. So, Kate, I wanted to come back around and talk a little bit about the Red Light District artifacts as well that came out of there. Yeah, all the artifacts that came out of the Red Light District, um, really interesting. A large large amount of the fauna remains, like I was saying before. But um, I think the really cool stuff is um, we have various bottles. So, you know, your regular beverage bottles for beer and liquor and then... uh, the medicine bottles, I think, are just, I think, have the the mo- most opportunity for research. But um, it was everything from, like, milk and magnesia bottles, you know, for regular stomach ailments. But then, you know, there was uh, treatments for venereal diseases, external treatments oh, that wow. they were using. Um, Nikki had mentioned before that we have quite a few Lysol bottles that they were using for feminine hygiene purposes and Listerine bottles as well. Lysol, Lysol? bottles for feminine <laughs> hygiene. I feel like we did. We have a weird press conference about that l- last yeah. year. <laughs> not not oh. clearly Trump didn't invent it then. So, okay. <laughs> Missoula was way ahead of the game. Yeah. So tell, clear. tell me, Kate, okay. 
Can you tell me without going into too much detail how Lysol was used? Yeah, so it was um, basically used as um, a uh, a liquid that they were using to douche with um, okay. for cleanliness um, yeah. or um, as a contraceptive. As a contraceptive, oh, wow. sure. Where you can kill everything. Hopefully, it kills everything. Um, but it's really you can look up Lysol ads from even up until what the forties, fifties, fifties, yeah, and it was yeah. still advertised for that purpose. Um, wow. Fascinating. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. They were using um, very delicate um, glass syringes to <sighs> to do that. So I wonder if they've changed their formula or uh, or if they've just taken that off the label as a possible use. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> that would be my guess. Yeah. Huh. Um, but I also want to point out to you that not just the women who are working in the red light district were doing this. It was women across the board. Um, right. Right. So it's, you know, it's, it's always an interesting artifact, but I love it because it's directly related to, you know, feminine hygiene when found in this context. And I just think that, um, that part of it is so interesting. Yeah. So what about the other medication for venereal diseases? What, what did you find there? What was, what are some things that came out? Yeah. Um, well, the one bottle that we have, um, is from a company um, that was actually um, producing venereal disease medications for soldiers to carry on their ration pack in World War One. Okay. So, um, wow. It was a lot of. It seems like a lot of patent medicine. So, um, you know, these mass market medicines where it was a shift from, you know, women getting medication from the doctor, and then they were kind of made this shift to treating themselves within the privacy of their home Mm -hmm. with these, you know, products that they can easily order from the catalog or from their local, you know, store. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, we also found um, lots of cosmetics. Okay. Um, Yeah. Even one that had uh, some residue still left in it of looked like some type of rouge or Mm -hmm. One of the students put a tiny bit on their hands and it did not come off easily. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> they had some staying powder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And that, that venereal disease bottle that we have, it's actually a complete bottle, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we're lucky so for that. So unusual. Yeah. But it's probably one of the most beautiful bottles that we have. It's so really? Nice. It's weird. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, the whole, we have a lot of really um, good looking perfume bottles as well. Um, like Palmer perfume was one of the popular ones on in the district um, and Florida water bottles that they were using for pretty much everything. Mm. Um, it was a perfume. It was supposedly you could drink it. Mm. You could bathe in it, use it as a bath oil. There were a lot of these like multi-use products. Um, huh. Like can... Evian. Sure. You can bathe in right. it. And... Right. Exactly. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's great. That's good. So, you know, it sounds like you found um, a lot of evidence that this was that of the red light district. And, you know, were these things that you were finding, these artifacts dated more towards uh, or more in the early 1900s or still back in the late 1800s or, or the full scope? I think with the red light artifacts and what I believe was used by the women, those are more towards the early 20th century. Okay. Um, more towards like the 1915 up era. Um, okay. But like I said, we have a really large collection and I've only gone through maybe a small fraction of it. So I think there's a lot more. Is your know. sense that the red light district was still kind of thriving then through up till 1920 or whatever? Um sort of as a distinct area and part of the city. Yeah. Um, our red light district, from what I've gathered in from the newspapers, it looks like the red light district was operating up until about the end of 1916, maybe early 1917, um, which is a little earlier, I think, than a lot of other red light districts closed um, in the West from what I've seen so far. Yeah, I think here in Bozeman, ours closed around that same time, maybe closer mm-hmm. to 1918, but definitely around 1917, 1918. 
Yeah, when yeah. All so, those things started closing across the West, you mm-hmm, said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And obviously it continued. The activity continued. It just wasn't right. so, like, they would just weren't so bold about it or they were getting good at hiding it. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, yeah. you know, um, they shut down the red light districts, but, but of course they didn't get rid of prostitution. Um, prostitution just went in different places. And, and you know, the women who are working in that, in, in those houses, in those red light district houses or buildings, couldn't just go and get a job at the ne- at the grocery store, you know, after working in that right. business. So they probably started um, working out of back rooms of saloons or back rooms of um, of you know um, bars and assignation houses and those sorts of things. So, so and, and Kate, you could speak more to this than I can, I'm sure. But yeah, so so where did those women go? I, I totally agree. To, they probably went all those places you just listed, you know, and um, I think one of the things I always thought was funny is that the main um, goal of the the reformers, you know, was that they were so worried about these people living among them, you know, and by closing this designated district, right. they actually forced those people right, into all right. their neighborhoods. Right. And then that was a common right. A common problem afterwards, you know, a common complaint in the paper is like, oh, well, these people are living next door to me. Well, yeah. I know it seems like they took this idea they had of like, let's put all this in a district so we can kind of keep it contained. And then they decide we don't we don't want that at all. We don't want this to be a place. I don't know. Maybe too many people are visiting it and yeah. having too much fun. <laughs> but yeah, so then you're you're left with an entirely different situation because the activities don't really go away. But you have to figure out where are those people going to be and how are they going to actually keep those services being conducted throughout the city. I know I find I find that period so fascinating and that it kind of is happening in all these Western towns. Yeah. Well, Kate, we'll have to come back and talk to you more about this once you've worked your way through all these artifacts and and see what you know, what what your analysis is. Um, but I want to change directions a little bit now and, and talk more about some of these underground spaces. And so, Nikki, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you. Um, you know, people are fascinated, like you said at the beginning, by urban archaeology and kind of what lays beneath our current city streets. And I have people come in and ask me this question all the time, you know, ask the question about tunnels under the under the red light district and ask about, you know, the the basements and, you know, people just have such a fascination with it. And so you as well had a fascination with it, like you were telling us, and you went ahead and did your your master's thesis on this and then wrote the book, Historic Underground Missoula, that documents your work. Um, during your time of your working on your thesis. Yeah, we've got the book right here. Nancy's holding it up. (laughs) It's such a great book. Um, So what did you want to better understand by looking at these basements, these underground spaces, these tunnels, I'm using air quotes, of Missoula's downtown? Um, I think, I think actually what we were just talking about previously, as far as, um, the rumors and the myths and things that started coming about because as Kate mentioned, you know, they closed down these red light districts and stuff. And then um, people had to go somewhere and, you know, and I think they started thinking, well, they're, they're hiding there. That's what these tunnels are for the basements and, and all of that. And so um, these underground spaces in a lot of, especially Western cities um, have this air of mystery about them. And so, and always this association with nefarious activity and the Chinese. Um, I've told this story so many times, but um, when we started looking into it that semester, it was because people had kept asking that question to our historic preservation officer at the time. And um, he said, you know, can you, is, would you possibly be interested in looking into this? And so we'd, we started that and um it seemed like in the beginning, a lot of times when we would talk to people in the community and business owners and things, it's like, do you know anything? Have you ever heard anything about the underground here in Missoula, about tunnels and things like that? And uh, people would always say nine times out of 10, it was, oh, yeah, we've heard about that. The Chinese built them, the tunnels. Um, interestingly, as an aside, the tunnels here in Missoula that were primarily steam tunnels, 
um, most of our Chinese population in Missoula was gone by then. I was just going to say, these mm -hmm. mysterious, invisible Chinese that left yeah. uh, decided just then to build all this tunnel. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, exactly. Didn't happen. And so, you know, we did this analysis of basically steam tunnels, um, sidewalk vaults, of course, um, these spaces under the sidewalks, and um, basement spaces. And so... We did that at various sites around town, trying to find some information and see what we could what we could find there. Um, and I was basically kind of, at least for my thesis, and I feel like this has evolved so much since then, but I was looking for um, kind of the factors like identity or class or economics or something like, you know, um, impact the use of these spaces. And um, ultimately and boringly, the data does not suggest that. Mm -hmm. um, but we did find some really interesting interesting information, though, while we were doing it. And so it kind of opened up these new avenues of research into the Chinese community, um, as well as set in motion so many other projects that we either might not have even thought about doing or um, alerted people to what we were interested in. And that brought us... Um, opportunities for research as well. Um, I know it sounds really vague, but I can talk about this for hours. I have talked about this for hours. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. Is that a question? <laughs> the history of that urban myth itself is interesting, just how it started, because you said so many of the business owners had all heard that, but then trying to trace the reality and its origins. I mean, it tells us more about this perspective that um, the non-Chinese residents of Missoula had. And it would just be fascinating to understand kind of when that actually really began and, and how. Um, I know. That, and that's something I, I still don't really know. Like, I don't, I don't know how that, you know, rumor kind of started um, or when, to be honest, um, except that in my research doing my thesis, I, I found that that was very common in other cities as well, particularly San Francisco, mm. um, this kind of idea of the exotic and, you know, what people don't know or understand, they make up in a lot of ways. And so um, I think that just kind of trickled into other places um, from, from places like San Francisco. I love where there were more people in underground spaces because they were a lot more crowded there. And that's sometimes that's where they lived in basements and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. So it always starts with some kind of kernel of, of truth, but probably not even anything related to what was really happening in, in Missoula or for that matter, Bozeman, because we mm -hmm. get those underground stories as well. Yeah. But I want to um, just briefly ask you, I love the images that you've included the photographs of artifacts that came out of some of your um, survey and archaeological work for your thesis and the the book that came out of it that you're in, in that you wrote and you know one is this this you know toothbrush and toothpaste from area two and then this glam men's aftershave um, fascinating but my favorite thing for sure is the pamphlet that was written by a physician that you say is primarily geared towards men that's called the protective features of underwear <laughs> and i i'm in love with this artifact um you said you found it during a surface collection with I, which i find amazing that this was um preserved and i don't know where area three is specifically but um, just to find these kinds of documents that are that are talking about these very personal, you know, hygiene sort of issues just adds so much of our depth to kind of imagining daily life, you know, of what it would have been like at, at that time. So I was wondering if you could speak to some of those things and, and how, how you were able to even choose which ones to include in your illustrations, although I'm really glad you picked that one. <laughs> So oh, that was not easy because um, we have a lot. But all of the ones that you just mentioned actually came from um, the drugstore portion of the old Missoula Mercantile um, okay. in that basement. So when I say surface collection, um, in a year or so previous to the work that we did there, they had already taken out the floor in this basement room because it was so um, 
it had a lot, a lot of water damage and stuff. And when they had first started thinking, the first owners had started thinking about doing some renovations there. Um, they took out that floor. And so we were able to go in and, and go through kind of, and that really was a surface collection at that point, but it would have been what was, what ended up under the floorboards. Right. Um, but then there were also this, these kind of what we called crawl space tunnels um, that we found in one section of the basement as well. Um, there's actually a, a really detailed map in the book for that. Um, and that's actually where we found the, the booklet for the protective feature of underwear. Um, and it probably, I mean, it's very thin, so it's possible that that's something that fell through the floorboards from above. Right, right. Um, Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really... You're it's like, really did, did that, you get that with your underwear, <laughs> or was that like a special thing you bought separately, or who needed to know that? Like, that's what I was like, wow, that still needed explaining? That's fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, but it would have come with, it would have been in that area kind of as an, it's actually an advertisement, believe it or not. It's, it's about a 15 page advertisement. Um, but it was written by a doctor who invented these linen mesh underwear um, that he was trying to sell. And it was at a time where he was trying to convince people that you, you know, wool may not, might not be the best thing to use for that type of, um, that type of clothing. And so, because, you know, it's warmer and it, Things get hot and so on. Um, And so this linen mesh underwear was supposed to be healthier. Mm. And maybe prevent some uncomfortable conditions from occurring. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's fascinating. I know. It's a great book. And I just so enjoyed reading through it because we had gone on a tour. And I think maybe, Nancy, you were there too. We were there together. (laughs) Yes. We went on a tour of the Mercantile before it was demolished. And um, as part of your public programming, with the um, Montana Archaeological Society, we went on a field trip through M- Missoula's underground that you led, Nikki, and and we um, we went all over the underground parts of Missoula. Do you guys still give tours? Is there still an active tour program in Missoula that is an underground tour? Um, we never. It's kind of funny because we ended up doing things like that, kind of. Um, randomly we never had a because we never charged for them we never had a set like that. okay yeah um but you know we the first time we did it was during historic preservation month god i think back in 2013 it would have been um and so that was the first time we did one of those tours and realized that how popular they could be because we had about 75 people on a walking tour wow. which was wow. really hard that's too um, much. Say, yeah, <laughs> it definitely was. Um, but we didn't expect that many people, you know? Yeah. Um, and we gave a lot of tours. I was just talking to Kate earlier today because she wasn't here back then. But, um, you know, our first event that we held inside the Merc was, you know, we expected eh, 15, 20 people to come by and hear us talk about the stuff that we, because it was a first Friday and we thought people would just drop in. Um and talk about our initial findings with the underground. And through the through the evening, we had I had to give the presentation twice because we had about five hundred people total. Wow! And I think I gave about twenty tours of the building that night. Oh my Amazing. gosh! Yeah. So, I think there's a real fascination and yeah. and hunger for that stuff, and to to be able to be offered that opportunity. It's it's very powerful to see how many people are interested. Mm-hmm. It is. It's kind of sad because. I feel like I've been asked a couple of times, you know, could you give a tour of like something like this? And I feel like a lot of those spaces that we went on even during the, during the um, Montana Archaeological Society field trip um, are kind of gone. Yeah. And so we can't really, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to put that kind of tour together whenever you're saying, so what used to be here, or, you know, just showing pictures, because then mm-hmm. it's like, well, why, why are we taking a walking tour? It, it's mm-hmm. just not the same, you know? It's so nice to have those historic buildings to really look at or go into if you're lucky enough, um, or even go into the basement of if mm-hmm. you're lucky enough. But it just isn't the same to say, and this building used to be here, you know, this historic building um, 
used to be here. It's just not the same. And so it's hard to do that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. So Nikki, you know, and Kate too, why do you think uh, we collectively have this fascination? We've talked about having this fascination with these places, but why do we have it? And and how does this information that you guys have gleaned in your work, in your research, how does this better help us better understand our own world today? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a fascination with this history because, you know, there's such a lack of it. You know, like Nikki was saying, there's a lot of stories, but there's not really anything connecting it you know, to the truth and what actually was going on. Um, I know with my research, I just really want to make sure I provide, you know, meaningful narratives um, for, you know, especially these women um, because they were, you know, they were deemed unimportant and nobody saw them important, you know, as important at the time. And, um, and I think that's why we don't really see them in the records as much. And we don't see, you know, a lot of, I guess, positive stories or, um, you know, I think it's important to take a look at how um, these women's like collective agency was demonstrated in this community and, you know, what ways were they exerting power, you know, despite their marginalized status. Um, you know, and I think the artifacts really help kind of provide that link to the archival records and all this research we're doing into the census and property records and newspapers because you know, like you said before, you have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt. And then, you know, I just I, I really like um, the interdisciplinary approach that we get to take when doing this type of research. And, you know, I think even it can have a lot of, you know, impact in how we view prostitution and the criminalization of prostitution today. You know, what's really changed since then, since we've made these um changes across the United States, you know, are women's rights protected more now? Um, does it affect women's rights to their bodies? How has that changed? Um, you could even go as far as looking at, you know, sex trafficking and how things have changed since, say, the Man Act or, you know, and I think that these districts, even though it's in Missoula, a small town, I think they hold a lot of information that will, you know, kind of help us answer those questions. Thanks for doing that work. I think it's really critical, re- really critically important right now. And I think it does re- help us reflect on what is still going on today, even though it's not in a designated zone within a town, and and what that means for the women, um, because it definitely can have some downsides rather than being in a in a house um, where they might, in some ways, have some safety, um, you know, or security in a different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Jumping off of what Kate said, as far as um, you know, these stories that that are either a lot of them made up or people don't know the true story or what have you, I think we um, a lot of times in our work we have a tendency to be very protective of the historical characters that we're that we're learning about, and because it's very easy, especially this kind of work, um, because people are fascinated with the exotic, right, and so. I think it's very easy in this kind of these kinds of stories to sensationalize it, um, which is one of the things we are always very careful with with any of the tours or things that we talked about with the underground. Um, even if that sometimes made us boring and it wasn't what people wanted to hear, you know, we wanted to make sure that we we got that right to kind of avoid, like in the, in the case of Cranky Sam, you know, we don't we want to make sure that he's not a caricature, you know, we want to make sure that that he's treated respectfully and the owners there have been really good about that. Um, But, you know, the unknown and, and, and people who are, you know, quote unquote, the other um, kind of leads to fear, which then leads to stereotypes and, you know, that still impacts society today. I mean, we can look at, um, we're seeing shocking parallels with the anti-Chinese sentiment that that's happening now with the, the same thing that was happening during Chinese exclusion um, in the mid to late 19th century. So, you know, we're doing a lot with our, with our work these days with social justice. And, um, and so it's kind of from that perspective, you know, what can we glean, what kind of information can we glean from this that, um, 
that kind of helps us understand those those patterns and learn from them and um, maybe even how to as a society potentially break those those negative patterns and so we're always trying to answer the so what question with the work that we do we right. like to yeah. you know anything like if we're if we want to know something it's kind of like well that's that's good that's interesting but so what mm -hmm. and what does that what does that mean what can we do with that information well, I think you've answered that um, beautifully for us today, both of you. Um, I want to thank um, both of you, Nikki Manning, Kate Gonzalez. I think the work that you're doing is incredibly relevant to today. I think whenever we focus on those that have been left out of the historical record and by telling the real evidence-based story to fill out people's lives and have them not be flat two-dimensional stereotypes, um, it helps us to sort of, I think, build that muscle and do that in the present and also busts myths that people might be harping back to when in the current day they're trying to understand, as you said, people just who are different from them. Um, so we could probably talk to you all day about red light districts and <laughs> underground spaces and archaeology, but unfortunately our time is running out for the podcast. But this has been such a wonderful conversation, and we re encourage everybody to read um, Nikki's book, which is widely available, again, Historic Underground Missoula, and we'll include links for more information about their archaeological excavations of the Cranky Sam Brewery location. Um, so thanks, ladies, so much for taking the time today to do this. Yeah, thank you for having us. This is great. Yeah, thank you for having us. We like to be able to... To, you know, even when the stories aren't that exciting, we like to sh the real stories are actually even more exciting. I agree. Just, you know, Wholeheartedly. Take the time to hear them. So, yeah. Thank you. Here, here. Yes. I completely agree as well. Thank you so much for your time, Kate and Nikki. It was so fun to have you on the program. And thanks for all our listeners out there. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you can join us again to find out more about the, the dirt, dirt on, on the, the past. past. If you're enjoying The Dirt on the Past, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Also, please tell your friends and leave us a review. It really helps people find us. We're a new podcast and trying to grow our listener base, so please share. Thanks, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to The Dirt on the Past, a podcast of the Extreme History Project and Gallatin Valley Community Radio, KGVM. To hear more episodes, visit our website at theextremehistoryproject.org. Thanks for listening, and until next time, keep searching out The Dirt on the Past.